Welcome back to Heart to Heart. This episode is sure to inspire you as we have the one and only Wendy McKenna as our guest. After a challenging early end to a dance and music career, Wendy transitioned to acting, where she faced the industry's harsh realities with bravery, optimism, and a bit of beginner's luck. She overcame adversity and used her out-of-the-box thinking to get the iconic role of Sister Mary Robert in Sister Act. Keep listening to hear some great lessons from a veteran actor, as well as one of the wildest audition stories we have ever heard. Before you listen, you've got to grab the backstage pass because it is packed with Wendy's top tips, insider advice, and additional resources that will give you a competitive edge. You can grab the backstage pass by going to podcastbackstagepass.com. I would love to share with you because our actors are going to want to know, and anybody who's not an actor is going to want to know, This amazing, inspiring story, of course, how you got the part of Sister Mary Robert in the movie Sister Act. It was not easy, let me tell you. Um, Okay, so, wow. Um, Do you want to hear, like, do you want to hear the whole thing? Yes. To nuts. (laughs) Mark's going like, yeah. Um, Well, uh, let me start with this. I was, I was 1991. It was 1991. And by the way, Wendy, 1991, I'll just slip this in there. I had no idea you went to, um, uh, you went to Juilliard for, 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 as a musician. I was a mus- Yes, I was a trained musician at Juilliard. I was a harpist. I went and, and you became a ball- ballerina? And a ballerina. So I was, I would go to, Ju- I grew up in Harlem, right? So I grew up in the projects in Harlem. Um, so there's this huge dichotomy. Right? I would, like be going home to Harlem. I was not allowed to go out and play. It was too dangerous. But I would get on the 104 bus, go down to Broadway, go down to Juilliard, and go to study with, oh my gosh, George Balanchine was, you know, I was with the School of American Ballet. And da- upstairs was my harp lesson. So I was upstairs and downstairs, harpist, ballerina. And then I was injured as a ballerina um, when I was 18. I was I was just like on the brink of getting into the company. And um, I had uh, some kind of tendonitis in the inguinal ligament. And they carried me out of class literally like with one hand on one thigh and my I, my leg was up here and it wouldn't come down. They carried me out of class like that, took me to the doctor and the doctor said, this has been going on for a while, hasn't it? And I went, yeah, I've kind of been in a lot of pain for a while, but I didn't want to tell anybody. And he said, you, you can never dance again. Now, that day, it all ended. And I thought, my mother said, um, well, you can always be a harpist. And I was like, no, I don't want to be in the orchestra pit. I don't want to be in the pit. Um, Plus, I had trouble with music theory. So I was like, I don't think that's going to happen. So I knocked around for about two years, not knowing what I wanted to do or what I was going to ever do. Met a young man, Peter Minor Jr., whose dad happened to be an acting teacher. And um, he was on tour with Equus. And I started following him around because I was in love with him. So I was like stalking him all across the United States, watching every show he did. No, I actually wasn't stalking. But um, <laughs> and I go <laughs> and Roxanne <laughs> Hart was in the show, and she was um, playing the love interest, I guess. And one day I said to Peter, "You know what, Roxanne Hart? I don't think you know. I don't know why everybody thinks she's so great. It looks like what she's doing is easy." And he challenged me to take an acting class, and I did. And I got kicked out of the first class I ever took because I was a nuisance and I was um, just giggling too much. I thought it was all ridiculous. And But Mr. Sibby, the teacher at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, said to me, when you're serious, come back because you're one of the best, the finest talents I've seen in a long time. I thought he was joking. I was like, you're kidding me. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And he said, well, that's part of, the, that's part of what's so good. And I never forgot that. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And he said... Well, that's kind of it. Hmm. Now he didn't In life too, yeah. More than that, but I carried that with me. I interpreted. I obviously, made up my own narrative about what all that meant. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and um, it's still with me to this day. So that's how I got into acting. But where were we? Oh, uh, sister had, act. The yeah, whole story. Yeah, the whole story. So uh, I had kind of given up on trying to get into film and TV because I was always being told, uh, she's not, you're not the, you're not pretty enough to be the ingenue, but you're not, not pretty enough to be the best friend. And in those days it was like, there was like no in between. You're either that or you're that. 
And you fall in between. I was tired of hearing, you fall in between the cracks. You fall in between the cracks. You fall in between. I was like, oh my God. So I literally was done. I thought I just have to quit because it's too frustrating. I'll just keep doing theater for the rest of my life. I'll give up on having a family and a big house somewhere. And I'll just do it. At which point, and my dad then passed away while I was sort of going through this um, crisis about do I want to keep doing this? And I was devastated. He and I were very, very close. Um, and I was grieving an off, what I decided was an awfully long time, too long. Um, I called my agent and I said, you know what? I just don't want to do this anymore. I, life's too short. I don't want to spend my days trying to convince people that I'm pretty enough or not pretty enough. Um, I'm exhausted by it. And I'm clearly not good enough for anybody to, you know, cast me in anything like that. So I quit. And my agent was devastated. He's like, you can't do that. And I said, no, I'm doing it. I went to Sedona. I had some spiritual experience like we do. You know, we go to Sedona when we quit acting. And I had a little bit of a spiritual experience on top of Boynton Canyon um, with a shaman. And after that experience, I came back to New York and it was still knocking around. And every time my agent would call with something, I'd say, please don't. I don't want to know about it. This is too hard for me to know. I'm really quitting. Well, he didn't listen. Thank God. And one day he called and he said, okay, this part, you won't be too, you, you won't be too pretty and you won't be too ugly. They want someone just mousy. I was like, okay, mousy. That's, I could do mousy. He goes, and your breast, you, we always had this joke, like my breast won't be big enough. They'll be too big. They'll be too small. And he said, your breast will be just right. And we laughed. <laughs> I said, okay, what is this part? And he goes, it's a nun. <laughs> okay. And he said, but it's a singing nun. And I said, okay, I could do that. He said, you have to sing a song. I said, great, I'll bring my guitar, which I always did when I had to sing. Because I, I didn't want to be without my guitar because I didn't, never knew what to do with my hands when I was singing. It always felt uncomfortable for me. Um, so he said, well, you can't bring your guitar. I said, well, all right, okay. I, where's the audition? I went down the audition. I read the Daisy Clock scene for, I didn't know it was Scott Rudin. Um, I didn't know who Scott Rudin was. I was just in a room with a bunch of people. Read the Daisy Clock scene. And I cried, by the way, I cried on the subway all the way to the audition because I was not being, I thought, true to, you know, what I had set for myself, which was just stop this craziness. Stop with the auditioning. Just, you know, let go and see where you, you know, it's sort of like when you're caught in the undertow and you finally go, oh, if I just let go, I'll float to the top. Right. It was kind of like that. Um, and I thought, this is not letting go. Now I want this and that's not good. So I was crying and I was crying for my dad and all that stuff. I'm at the elevator at Johnson Lyft, I think it was. And this guy who turned out to be Scott Rudin comes running after me. And he said, that was just lovely, just wonderful. I said, thank you. And he said, can you sing? And I said, oh yeah, that's right. I heard you're supposed to sing. I said, oh yeah, yeah. I sing. He goes, do you sing? And I went, oh yeah. Now I knew when he said, do you sing? that he meant like, are you like, and yeah. I lied, like all actors do. I went, oh yeah, I can sing, I can roller skate, I can, you know, I can fence, sure. <laughs> got on the elevator, went home and forgot about it. Didn't think I'd get a call back. Got a call back. My agent calls and he says, so um, they loved you. They really loved you. And now you have to sing. And I said, okay, I'm going to bring my guitar though. And he said, if you bring your guitar, they literally won't see you. You have to pick a girl group song. It has to be like a Diana Ross song and you have to just kill it. And I said, okay, I can't kill it. I don't kill it that way. I'm a, I have a really nice voice, but I'm not killer, right? He said, uh, I said, so tell them I'm not going to the callback. And there's this long pause. And he said, if you don't go to the callback, no one will ever, Johnson Liff will never call me again. I'm like, oh my God. So I'm sitting around with my friend, my roommate at the time, and we're getting high. <laughs> and we're just sitting around. I'm like, oh my God. And I don't, and I'm not, and I didn't smoke very much, but I am so just like smoking my way through this. <laughs> and I said, Steph, I, I can't do, why am I do? why am I worried about my agent? I should be worried about me. Why am I doing this? And she said, I'll tell you what. Let's get the cassettes out and let's play some girl group songs. It is because of my roommate, Stephanie, that I got this role, actually. She goes, okay, get the cassettes out. We start to listen to the cassettes. And I notice that 
all of Diana, most of Diana Ross's songs, she starts out talking. She goes like, the day you left me, I didn't know what I was going to do. And then you knocked on my door and la, 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 right? And they start. And so we're just joking. We're hot and we're joking about how she does it. And then I start to do a takeoff. And Stephanie goes, why don't you just do a takeoff? Why don't you just go to the audition and do a takeoff of Diana Ross doing a song? And then you won't feel like you're failing. And I went, yeah. I said, and why don't I bring my own backup singers too? And she goes, yeah. Why don't you bring your own backup singers too? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I think, I think I'll call. I know somebody who knows a bunch of backup singers. And Steph goes, yeah. And they should be black because of the, you know, the story about sister and Whoopi and all that. I said, yeah, I know someone who knows a lot of black gospel singers. And it was Richard Greenberg, the playwright, who I'd just done a play for. Oh. <laughs> so the next day, although I wasn't high anymore, I was like, yeah, okay. Dad's gone. Career's gone. <laughs> Why, not? Why not? So I pick up the phone and call Richard. I said, do you know anybody? He goes, oh, do I? He sends me 10 names. I call the first three. They all go, we'd love to do it. So the deal was this. I picked a song. I picked three backup singers. We had one rehearsal, one rehearsal to pick a song and to figure out what this audition was going to be. I, I told them I would get their eight by tens in um, to Johnson Lip, and I did. And I paid them each like $75 and they were thrilled. We had one rehearsal. We picked Please, Mr. Postman. Where did you rehearse that, Wendy? Say again. Your apartment, where was the rehearsal? The rehearsal was my agent's assistant. Oh, what was her name? She was lovely. My agent's assistant played the piano. And she said, come on over to, to my place. So the rehearsal was at her place somewhere, I think in Chelsea. And the gal showed up and I told them, I said, wear sequins, wear like, just be big. Sequins, high heel shoes. Because I want the contrast between me. I'm going to wear like a big black dress and no makeup, right? And look like Sister Mary, what I thought Sister Mary Robert would look like. And they were like, okay, we picked Please Mr. Postman. We did it a couple of times and I taped, I taped the rehearsal. I think I still have the tape of it on a cassette. Um, and we said, okay, auditions tomorrow, show up at this time. And they said, but how are we going to come into the room? Are we going to walk into the room with you? And I said, I haven't decided yet without a net, right? I don't, I, you know, without a net, I'll figure it out at the last minute. Get to, the, get to the audition and everybody in New York is there. All the people that I'm always up against. I think, you know, Jace with Cameron, all the guys that were right coming up with me. And I looked around and I was like, oh man, these guys are all really good. Oh, well, I said to myself, doesn't matter. I'm not in the business anymore. This is my, this is my big last hurrah, right? So the gals come and, I, and everybody's looking at them like, who are these women? Because they're like, they're big. Um, and I said, uh, okay, guys. Let's go into the ladies' room over there. And here's where we're going to do the audition. I said, so I do this whistle, right? Um, grew up in New York, doing my New York cab whistle. I said, when you hear the whistle, I mean, be outside the door, right? Wait, wait, wait in the ladies' room um, until the last minute. When you know I've gone into the room, come out, listen for a whistle. When I whistle, I want you to push that door open really hard and come in and improv, right? Like, we're here for you, honey. We're, you know, we're going to help you with the postman. He said, okay. Now all the actors in New York are like, they're sitting there, like looking at me, like looking at the women, looking at me, looking, and then someone leans forward and goes, what are you doing, Wendy? What are you up to? And I said, I don't know, but it's either going to be like the glory, like my glory day or the worst day of my life. <laughs> and they were like, are those women? And I said, shh, shh just, right. They call me in. I give the music to the accompanist, which I'd never done in my life because I always had a guitar. So I give the music to the accompanist and I lean over and I said to the accompanist, okay, here's the deal. I'm doing Please Mr. Postman. And he goes, he's really snarky. And he goes, uh-huh, I can see that. And I go, okay, so I'm going to start out talking to the postman and I'm going to ask him if there's any mail from my boyfriend. And he's not going to answer me. When he doesn't answer me, I get kind of upset and I whistle and he goes, hold it. He goes, hold it. You whistle? I go, yeah, I'm going to whistle. He goes, why? And I go, well, for my gals. He goes, what gals? What the fuck are you talking about? Now, meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, Hollywood is sitting at this table. So you have like, I think it was Michael Eisner or you have Scott Rude and you have like, I don't know, everybody. Um, and in my imagination, I think Bette Midler was there. I don't know why, but that's, I, could, I just remember going, oh my God. 
And so we're whispering. And he goes, so you're going to whistle? I said, yeah. And then these women are going to come in and they're going to back me up. And there's this like long pause and he goes, you're really doing this? I said, yeah. Like, you really want to do this? Can I talk you out of it? <laughs> He's like, <"Can> I <laughs> no, no. And he goes, okay, it's your funeral. <laughs> and I wasn't nervous at all at that moment. Honestly, I had no nerves. And suddenly my whole body got adrenalized, like whoosh. And I went, it's like I woke up and I went, oh my God, what am I, what am I doing? Oh shit, what the fuck am I doing? And, but then it was too late. So, so I walk into the middle of the room and I stand there like I was told to stand there, like, cause I don't have my guitar. I don't know what to do. And I say, you know, I, I pick a you know, spot for the postman to be. And my vibrato is so, I'm so nervous that it's like, it's like, there must be some word today from my boyfriend. I'm practically weeping. And they start to laugh because they think it's the character. Right. Like, and, and I'm thinking, OK, they, OK, good. So they can't tell I'm nervous. They think I'm doing the character because she's always scared. And I said, please, Mr. Postman, look and see. Is there a letter, a letter for me? He doesn't respond. I go like this. And then I whistle. Right. For backup. Right. I do this whistle. And then these three women come in and the accompanist did the right thing. He went da, 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 da. <laughs> And they, and I'm singing and they're singing and they're drowning me out, which was pretty much the whole idea. Um, and they sounded brilliant. I couldn't hear myself again. Great. Um, and they were improv and pushing me forward and, you know, saying, go, go talk to the postman. It's okay. You can do it. Like I was too shy. So it was so sister Mary Robert and the place went crazy. The, the minute that that door opened, you heard, you can hear on the tape, because I taped that as well. I put a little cassette recorder in my duffel bag next to the piano. And you can hear everybody going, what the, f what the, and then when they realized what it was, they had the best time. And Scott Rudin ended up on the floor, pounding on the floor with the palm of his hand. He was laughing so hard. Um, I'm so glad I taped it, because I probably would have thought, no, nah, that didn't really happen. And it didn't really happen that way. But it did. And it took a while for the laughter to calm down after the song. And the gals, I told them to, to shuffle out and file out um, singing, you got to wait a minute, wait a minute, um, so that the casting people and the people in the room wouldn't feel like they had to deal with them because they weren't really invited to the audition, were they, right? I, I invited them. So they shuffled out right on cue. And once the laughter died down, Scott Rudin got up and he came up to me and he took my hand. And again, I didn't know Scott Rudin from, I was like, just that guy, right? That guy who was always there. He, he took my hand and he said, that was the most brilliant thing I've ever seen. And I was still out of breath. And I said, thank you. Thank you. And he said, what on earth, what on earth were you thinking? I mean, what made you do this. And I said, well, do you remember when you came out to the elevator and asked if I could sing? And he goes, yeah. I said, I lied. And there's this long pause. And then people started to like everybody, Hollywood started to kind of, you know, giggle. And I said, I did. I lied, everybody. I, I have a really nice voice and everything. I could play in a nightclub probably. I could do some Diane Keaton kind of Woody Allen kind of, you know, song. But I said, I don't sing like you need me to sing. And it was sort of too late. And so I kind of had to come. And so I figured, why not? He goes, so you figured why not? <laughs> I said, yeah. He goes, well, lucky us. And I said, you think? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I wish, you know, I wish I still had the guts to do what I did then, now. Because what I did then, I said, I said, well, thank you very much, everybody. It was, you know, very nice to meet you. I'm glad at least you got entertained and I grabbed my duffel bag and I started to go. And Scott and the musical director, I think his name was Jimmy Vivino. I think Mark Shaman was there too. Mark Shaman, Jimmy Vivino, Scott, it was crazy. And they went, no, 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 no. You're not going anywhere. Right? And I said, and that's you know, when I tell my students, just enjoy yourself. Because even if it's wrong, 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 
right? For the, the wrong choice is wrong choices, right? If you're if you're there and you're committed and you're having a good time, you know, they'll keep you in the room. They'll keep you in the room. They'll give you, they'll say, that was wrong, but it was great. Now do it this way, which is basically what Scott and everybody said. They said, okay, so that was really fun. And now we want to see if you can really sing. And I said, and I looked at everyone. I said, I really can't. Thank you so much. And I kept going. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I wasn't trying to be funny. I wasn't trying to get them to keep me there. I was just like, bye. And they, they literally were like, no, 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 come back. Put your bag down. I was like, okay. And I said, you're, you're just going to be disappointed, you guys. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> and they said, do you know the song Where the Boys Are? And I said, I think I do. They get, they said, can you read music? I said, yes, I can. They gave me the music and I sang Where the Boys Are, right? And there's this long pause and I said, okay, so you see, thank you very much. Being very kind for not, you know, saying anything derogatory. I'm going to go now. They kept me again. They may, and everybody outside was like, what is happening in that room? Can you imagine all the actresses out there going, what the fuck is happening? There's like backup singers. It's now been like, she's been in there for 45 minutes. Um, and they made me sing the song again in a different key. Mm. And somebody, I think it was Mark Shaman or somebody said, you know, you really have a really good voice. I said, really? They go, yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you. And I said, thank you. And I left. A couple of days later, my agent called and said, you didn't get it, but they'll never forget you. What the hell happened in that room? And I told them, told my agent. He said, they loved you, but they need someone who couldn't like sing gospel. But whatever you did went great. I said, okay, great. I quit again. I quit. I'm not doing any auditions. Then what happened was this. About a month later, I got a call. They want you to come in again. I'm like, why? I still, I have, I can't, still can't sing like that. Um, they said, well, they want you to work with somebody in the room. So I said, great. Came in. Somebody tried to work with me a little bit, gave me some warm ups. I did it again. Still didn't get the job. A month, another month went by. I'm bartending. They called me back again. You got to go to Johnson Lift Studio again. They want you to come again. I said, guys, I'm not, I still can't, nothing's changed. I haven't been taking voice lessons. Nothing's changed. And they said, they want you to come in. Came in again. Still didn't get it. Three months went by. During this time, what I heard was that they were doing an international search for somebody that could act and sing the part. International, right? And so here's what happened. And bartending at the Raccoon Lodge. <laughs> Mark, you know the Raccoon Lodge? I um, bartended there. We were bartending together that day. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, for a time we were bartending together. Anyway, so I was bartending and the phone behind the bar rang. And it was my agent. And he said, are you sitting down? He said, you kind of got the part, but not really. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, well, they now want to see if you can lip sync. Because they, can't, they just can't forget you. They can't forget you. They want someone that can sing. And they have people that can sing, but they can't forget you. So my love, you're going home now. And you're going to pack a bag as if you might be gone for three months. Because if you go to Mark Shaman's place in Bel Air, wherever he lived. And he gives you this piece of music that he's going to give you. You have 20 minutes to learn it as a gospel piece with lots of riffs to learn it, sing it out loud. But, you know, he's going to watch to see if you can lip sync it. Um, if you can learn something really fast and then he's going to ask you to lip sync it without the music. So you're going to have to be, I was like, Oh my God, I ran home. I packed, I got on a plane, went to LA, a limo picked me up at the airport, went to Mark Shaman's place. He gave me um, Come Holy Ghost, which was one of the best pieces. It got cut from Sister Act, but it was brilliant. I had 20 minutes with this cassette recorder. I learned it. I came out into his living room and he goes, okay, here we go. Press his play. And I sing it. And he goes, okay, now do it without the back, without the, you know, the woman singing. And I did it. And he goes like this. He goes, okay, well, thank you for coming. And I said, oh, okay, well, thanks for giving me this last shot. You guys have always been great. He goes, hold on a second. I just have to make a phone call. Picks up the phone. He goes, hey, um, can you get the limo here to pick up Wendy? And I'm like, and he goes, uh, and take her to rehearsal. Oh. <laughs> and I was just like, it was lovely of him to do it that way. It was really fun and sweet.
and I started to cry. I just couldn't believe it. After all those years of just like not getting the, not being able to break into that part, right? The film and TV part. And I literally got in a limo and went to the rehearsal studio where Whoopi was there, Kathy was there, Mary Wicks was there. All the nuns were there. Everybody, they had casted already. They had been, I think, rehearsing for two weeks already. That's how hard they were looking for Sister Mary Robert, right? And they had someone standing in for Sister Mary Robert, just someone who had a great, really great voice. And on the way, Mark Shaman goes, okay, so here's the deal. You have a good enough voice, right? So you don't have to worry. Just sing out loud. It's not going to ruin anything. It's not going to you know, throw people off. But learn all the songs. And then we have this and we're doing that. And this. I said, great. So everybody was lovely. They greeted me. They were like, yay, we are Sister Mary Robert. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh. Um, and about, I guess, about a week into, like, the third week of rehearsal, door opens and Jimmy Vivino and I think Mark Shaman was there, walk in just to hear how we're doing. And I'm now I'm completely singing way out loud. I'm doing all the riffs. I'm singing all the songs. I'm really comfortable. I'm not nervous. They stop rehearsal. They go, hold up, hold it. Wendy, what are you doing? And I went, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, you guys. I'm so sorry. I should not be singing that loud. And they went, no, 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 no. What, what are you doing? I said, I, I'm just, you said it was okay to sing. They go, yeah, but why didn't you sing like that at the audition? And I said, because I was nervous. I have the job now. And they go, uh, yeah. Okay, hold on a second. And then they're like, da, 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 da. They pull me out of line. They put me in another limo. <laughs> I've been in so many limos in my life. <laughs> <laughs> they put me in another limo. And I said, where are we going? They go, we are now going to audition you for your own voice. I'm like, what? They go, well, we've been spending this last week, actually, for weeks, we've been spending all this time trying to find the voice of Sister Mary Robert. Then we cast you, and now we're trying to match your voice. But we think now you can actually sing it. And I was like, are you? What? So we get to this studio. It's like a voiceover type, you know, sound studio. Jimmy Vivino puts me into the room, and he goes, okay. <laughs> I'll never forget this. He goes, okay, what the fuck do you need? <laughs> Do now right here what the fuck you just did there. Excuse me for all the fucks, but what do you need? And I went, I need a bottle of red wine. <laughs> and I need you to put up a black flat. I don't want you to watch me. I don't want anybody to see me. And they go, okay, wine. Somebody go up for wine. Okay, somebody put up a black thing, right? And I stay there with the headphones on. And they go, what's your favorite song? I go, come Holy Ghost. And they go, okay, come Holy Ghost it is. Do we have the backup track? They go, yeah. So I'm standing there. Somebody comes in with <laughs> Pinot and wine. They give me the Pinot and I'm, I'm chugging the wine because I'm so nervous and I want to do so well for them because they've been through it with me. Right now I'm feeling guilty for not having been able to sing all that time. I get myself a little tipsy. I go, okay, <laughs> I'm ready. And they go, okay. <laughs> the music starts. And I sing Come Holy Ghost, the way I've always wanted to sing Come Holy Ghost. Um, nobody's watching, so I feel like good. And um, after I'm done, all I know is this is what happened. The, the, the black thing comes down, and I, Jimmy, forgive me, but Jimmy, you know, Sandy goes, like, <laughs> what did I do? And he goes, I said, what? He goes, if you had sung like that, it's just one of the auditions in New York right? We would have gotten you immediately to a coach because all you are is tight on the high notes. You just get tight up there. Those are the only notes you can't play. You can't sing. You're, you know, pitch perfect, which I had from Juilliard and all that stuff, right? You're pitch perfect. Your tone is great. You just can't get those high riffs. And you could have by now, if you'd just done that, I'm like, oh my gosh. So what are we going to do? And they go, here's what you're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. And this is what nobody knows, um, except for my students and the people I tell the story to. Um, and Disney, obviously, and Jimmy Vivino and Mark Shaman, is they said, you are going to now sing live. We're doing this live, you know. I was like, okay. You are going to sing live. And when we find the voice of Sister Mary Robert, and we think we have already, her name is Andrea Robinson, we are going to mix you. We're going to mix you. 
but you're going to sing live. It, there's never going to be a moment where you don't sing, where you just lip sync. I'm like, really guys? <laughs> All my dreams are coming true. Like, okay, <laughs> okay, great. And that's what we did. So they recorded it. I didn't meet Andrea Robinson until 2017. Oh. I didn't meet the wonderful woman and singer who sang the voice of sister Mary Robert in certainly um, who sang really like the parts where people go, Whoa. Right. Uh, as far as I know, um, until we did the view until we did the 25th anniversary of sister act on the view. And it was really cool to meet her. But so I, they just pipe Andrea in and I would sing with her on every, on every shoot. Right. And then Jimmy would do his magic in the studio, whatever magic they do. Um, from what I understand, sometimes it was mixed. Sometimes it was all me. Sometimes it was all Andrea. And um, and what happened was when the movie came out, it was a huge hit. I didn't know what I was supposed to say because everybody was like, was that your own voice? Was that your own voice? And so I finally called my agent. I said, we have to ask Disney what I'm supposed to say. I don't want to step on anyone's toes, right? I, do I say it's Andrea? Do I say, what do they want? And they said, and what Disney wanted me to do was just say, it was me, right? I guess because technically, but I never felt right about it. It felt very uncomfortable. And honestly, later on, somebody gave me the idea that that was actually never the case, that Disney never actually said that, which I'm not going to go into, right? Um, and I think that they actually never said that. I don't know that they ever gave anybody an answer. Um, but I would avoid it at all costs, right? I would avoid that question, right? Because what do you say? Well, tell the whole story like I just said to you, right? Well, sometimes it's me, sometimes it's not me. Because how would I know, really? Mm -hmm. All I know was that when it was time for um, royalties, that I was getting royalties. I was on the CD, right? Wow. So... I had to be there. <laughs> um, and I don't know, just as an aside for you guys, we might want to cut that part. I don't know because Sister Act 3 is coming up and maybe I just said something I'm not supposed to say. No. But that's that's what happened. And um, yeah, it's it was quite the, the journey, quite a story. Hey, it's Brian. I'm dropping in on an important announcement. What you need to know is you have more control over your career than you think. The thing standing between you and the career you want is your connections. And that's where one-on-one -on -one next level comes in. If you are not a member yet, you can apply to join at oneononenextlevel.com. Press pause and do that now. If you are already a member and you are ready to get back on track, we want to invite you to book a strategy session with us led by myself personally. We will help you prioritize which classes make the most sense given your career goals. You can find these under the resource hub in your account portal. We can't wait to hear your success story. That's why I got so ex excited to have you on this podcast because so many listeners hopefully are out there that you know need to hear this. Yeah. Because that's how it happens when, you know, there's a, a, a film when Sean Connery in that film, um, The uh, Untouchables, mm -hmm. and he said something like, uh, we don't, I, I don't know, but the, the main slogan is, you don't wait for it to happen, you make it happen. You make it happen, mm -hmm. 100%. We, absolutely. And you know what's interesting, Mark? You just said that um, I hear, I'm a firm believer in law of attraction, always have been. I grew up. I grew up that way. I grew up in a household that was very spiritual, I guess. There were tarot cards. There was astrology. There was, it was very different, right? Your mother and your father, both? My mother. My mother was a famous astrologer. And Whoa, very, please very tell us. Yeah, my mom, Diana K. Rosenberg. And you can her website's still up. Uh, she passed away in 2012. But when she passed away, there were uh, memorial services in Russia, UK, and the U.S. Whoa. Whoa. In the astrological community, these were people I didn't know, right? I mean, I knew that she was really, like, well respected. She'd written a two volume book um, about, like, some groundbreaking book about astrology that married sidereal astrology with tropical astrology. All I know is that um, she she opened up that world to me. So, so what I was going to say, Mark, is when you say make it happen, right? Um, I think there's a a, a, a a balance 
now that has to be struck because so many people are talking about the law of attraction. And I'm so thrilled about that because I believe in that, right? It's worked for me. It worked for me before I knew it was the law of attraction. Looking back, I go, oh, that was very law of attraction. That was very, you know, I manifested that. And this is how I did it, which I'd love to talk about in a minute, which um, has something to do with beginner's luck um, uh, and an audition, that another audition story. But, but now it feels like there's a lot of weight given to law of attraction, law of attraction. I'll manifest it. I'll manifest it. I'll close my eyes. I'll feel what it feels like to have gotten the job already, right? And all that great stuff, um, which is terrific, but not as a steady meal, right? There's also action needs to be taken, as you just said, right? You got to make it happen. And making it happen is not always vibratory, okay? <laughs> um, it, but, you know, I think the two are not mutually exclusive. They have to happen hand in hand, right? You've got to take, there's certain physical steps on the physical plane that we need to take. Now, I'm not telling everybody they should bring in backup singers to their auditions. I mean, that could have been a really bad day for me, let's face it. I could have ended up with egg on my face. But you don't, you don't, nothing ventured, nothing gained. And nothing ventured, nothing gained. It's also easy for me to sit here and talk, talk about that story too when I was in a certain mindset after my dad had passed away, right? I was sort of like, well, not, what, you know, I've sort of given up, so why not? But, but I have to say that when. Stop that, hold that right there, Wendy, because yeah. we went out to lunch. Yeah. And just recently, you know what I mean? Look, you're an actress, so there's always like these like, uh, up hills and valleys. And so, you know, you were kind of saying something like that. And I'm telling you, you're in for a, 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 a nice surprise coming up where you were, you were, um, you were kind of, you were down, but like you said, you have, you got to go back to the beginning to, to go climb the mountain again. Yes. Yes. We keep, I, I for me, I know for me, I can't speak for everyone else. Um, because my beginnings were so, so strange and it wasn't just the Sister Act beginning. Sister Act was the beginning of my more film career. But I had I was on stage all the time up until then. Um, and my stage career was also a really interesting beginning and fortuitous. So when I feel lost, which I often do, right, um, uh, I, go, I go, Wendy, just remember how, how it felt, speaking of law of attraction and energy, how it felt at the beginning. You didn't know anything. I fell into this business. I literally fell into this business by crashing an audition for a Broadway show and getting it. I didn't even know what an EPI was. I had no equity card. I'd never been on stage before as an actor, ever. But I crashed. Was it Pygmalion you're talking about? No, this was a show called like, The Survivor. Oh, um, wow. Jack Eisner wrote it. It was about the kids that held down the Warsaw Ghetto against the not true story. It was based on a novel he'd written, a brilliant, just incredible. I wish somebody should do it again. Um, and it had, oh my gosh, you had um, Joe, oh, what are, who are the cast? David Marshall Grant, Anne Lang. Um, oh, who was it? Uh, I'll, I'll remember it later. But if, if you look it up, if you look it up, you can maybe remind me. But um, incredible cast. And, and here's how that came about. But before I tell you how that came about, which I find, which I think is really inspirational, and has a lot to do with how I teach um, or how I look at my career, how I re-inspire re myself, is, um, is that when, so when I'm lost and when I'm feeling bitter, you know, um, or I'm sure I'll never work again, I try to remember what it was like to not know anything. A lot of people go, oh, I'm lost. I'd better bone up on this. I'd better read another book. I'd better take another class, right? I'd better watch myself tapes again, the ones that are good, right? I'd better deconstruct and then construct. But honestly, um, if, if you can go back to that time where you didn't know anything, that's where the gold is, I think, right? Because there's no, what is there none of? There's no resistance. When you don't know what you don't know, you can't have resistance to something you don't know anything about, right? And 
So that's kind of what happened to me. And now I'll tell the story about getting the survivor and why I think beginner's luck is what, why it's lucky, why beginners are lucky. Hmm. Okay. So you should always be the beginner. Always be the beginner. And obviously I, I can't be a beginner and none of us, you know, at our age who've been in the industry a lot can't really go and be a beginner anymore, but we can immerse ourselves into that feeling of what that was like. And remember that it doesn't, it's not always doing more, learning more, taking another class. Sometimes it's just, you know, go read, um, go read the untethered soul, right. Um, by Michael Singer. And that'll, wow. Um, that's why spiritual books are so helpful to me. Um, go read about resistance. Um, so, and how it messes you up. So here I was, um, I was following back to the story about my boyfriend who was on tour with Aquas and I'm following him around. I don't know what I can do with my life. I can't dance anymore. I don't want to be a harpist in the pit. Um, I get kicked out of the first acting class I've ever taken for disrupting the class by being too giggly and not taking it seriously <laughs> enough, which and looking back was probably a great thing. Um, and this, so my boyfriend's father, Peter Minor Sr., was an acting teacher. Talk about fate. Um, so I'm hanging out with Peter. The tour is over. I still don't know what I want to do. I'm working at a coffee shop. I'm depressed. Um, I can't finish high school. I didn't even finish high school because I had... ADD, I had severe dyslexia. They didn't know it at the time. I'm just thinking, I'm, I'm messed up. There's no way. I can't have a life. Um, and one day, um, Peter's, my boyfriend's brother, Robert, says, um, I have to direct a scene for college. I have to direct a scene from Shakespeare. Would you be my Ophelia? I lost my Ophelia. And I go, I don't know Shakespeare. I don't know. And he goes, please, please, it's tomorrow. I'm like, no, no, I don't do that. I'm not an actor. I got kicked out of acting school. <laughs> <laughs> and he begs me, I go, oh, he hands me the thing. I've never read Shakespeare. Shakespeare. We read it. He goes, okay, now my dad's going to watch it. He's an acting teacher. I'm like, oh my God. Okay. So we go into his dad's office. We read the scene and his dad goes, Peter Minor Sr. goes, Wendy, he goes, did you ever think about acting? And I go, oh. no, apparently I'm talented. They said that at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, but no. And he goes, would you like to take my class? You're very, very talented. And I said, come on. I was like, literally like, come on. And then anyway, I ended up going to his class, but I was too afraid to actually open my mouth and work. So I sit, sat in the back, I sat in the rafters and for three weeks, I watched everybody do scenes and exercises. One of the exercises was to say, I can't five different ways. And I was watching these actors get up and just do it. And I was like, that's amazing. How do they have the courage to just do that? To say, I can't five different ways and come up with those ideas. I was like in awe. And every time we had a class, Peter would go, are you ready to come down and work, Wendy? And I go, no, no, no um, maybe next week. And finally, one day he said, Wendy, you're going to come down here and you're going to do the exercise. I said, I can't. He goes, oh, you just said it. I said, what? He goes, I can't. I go, yeah, but no, I really can't. He goes, oh, you just did another one. <laughs> right? He's brilliant. And he gets me to the front of the class and he goes, okay, just say another three more and you're done with the exercise. And, you're done. <laughs> and I clammed up. I was too shy. I was too scared. And he goes, okay, can you dance? I can't five different ways. And I went, oh yeah, that's fine. He goes, the students were like, oh, she's going to dance. That's our fear. That was their fear to move. And my fear was to speak, right? And I go, oh, yeah, I can do that. And I, I danced, I can't, five different ways without blinking an eye, without being self-conscious, but to open my mouth and say, I can't was a mess. Right? So I do some Martha Graham, I don't know, you know, something like that. And I do some Pearl Lang and I do some ballerina stuff. And I interpretive danced, I can't, five different ways. <laughs> and I remember looking back, they were like these rafters, these, um, these like uh, base, what are they called? Um, the seats were uh, uh, raked. Raked, right. And I remember looking up to the back and, and I mean, everybody was just like gobsmacked. And I thought, what's the big deal, right? And so they started talking to me. They thought I was just this like 
stuck up da- ba- ballerina in the back row, which probably I was, but <laughs> be that as it may, right? They started talking to me and saying, like, where are you from? And how did you dance that? And where, right? And so I started to make friends. And then one day I said, apropos of nothing, I said, say, how does one get work as an actor, you guys? And they were like, oh, we have to have an eight by 10 and you have to have a resume. And I said, and then where do you guys find auditions? Oh, go to the newsstand, get backstage. This is 19, whatever. Get backstage and there are open calls. I was like, okay, that sounds great. And I did it. I went to the newsstand. I got backstage. I, I saw the survivor. I circled it. My dad was a Holocaust survivor. I was like, well, that's going to be my job. That sounds good. I had no idea how impossible it was to get a Broadway show. I was just like, okay, that was fun. I danced. I can't five different ways. Now maybe next week I can do a scene or something. But in the meantime, I'm going to see if I can get a job. And what's with the uh, the Holocaust jobs, Wendy? You know, like I saw you in the shop. <laughs> and you were, you, and Wendy, by the way, that was... One of the most brilliant things when you did the shawl, I, I mean, a great performance. Oh, thanks. And weren't you with, you were uh, uh, Diane Weiss. Diane Weiss, yeah. I couldn't believe so, that. Was, so I, is I, that a coincidence? That yeah, It was you know, a coincidence, yes. Shawl, <laughs> the other. coincidence. I'm the Holocaust girl. <laughs> yeah, you're a Holocaust girl. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You have a Holocaust, call me. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm your girl. I'm your oh survivor. My. And you're also a chameleon because when I, when, when I, I'm telling you, when I saw Sideman, I could not believe, I was like, that is not her. <laughs> you, you became this like old lady. And at the time you were, how old were you when, when you did Sideman? I did Sideman. I was well, 30. Oh, you're in your 30s, because I, I know you're sensitive about oh, no, no. <laughs> oh, Actually, no, it's older than that. Um, I am sensitive about my age, but only in as much as IMDb puts it out there and it makes me not get jobs. But that's that the yeah, I'm no, of course. I aged up so happy. Actually, I love it. And I aged up in the shawl as well. But when I got the Survivor, I was actually, I was like 30. I, was, I got pregnant during that show, so. But when I did the shawl, I was about 35, 36. And both of those, Mark, I aged up about... Well, for the shawl, I aged up. I was 35 and I played 57. Um, and in Sideman, I went, I bounced around from, I think it was 18 to 50, to mid 50s, back to 18 again. I was like up and down the stairs backstage, just running and changing and putting on age makeup and coming back down. And then it was a wild ride. And I, and amazing. Mid 50s alcoholic woman. So that's mid-50s even older. You know what I mean? The alcoholic. Oh my gosh. She was a mess. Oh, what was her, her name? Crazy Terry? Uh, I, uh, I, I wrote it down. Her name was, uh, now it's going to kill me because I have it. Uh, Crazy Terry, yeah. Does she have a last name? Did Terry have a last name? Uh, I'll, I'll get it. Uh, we'll, uh, I don't remember if the last I'll name I'll get it for you. How old were you when you got The Survivor? Um, when I got The Survivor, I was 21. 20. I think I was 20. Wow. It was my first job. But here's... Here's the thing about the survivor that I just love this. Um, so I, you know, I go to this, I see, I circle it in backstage and I go to 311 West 43rd street. <laughs> I remember. Um, and there's this long line and it said it was an EPI. I didn't know what an EPI was. I just heard someone say, Oh, it's open. You know, it's open. So there's this long line and there's a guy at a desk outside and set up and I'm like, oh, this is taking forever. Right. Wow. I get to the front of the line and I'm seeing people handing him something and signing something. And I get to the desk and he goes, equity card, please. And I go, sorry, yes. equity card, please. I go, what's that? He said, equity card, your union card. And I go, oh, I don't have one. And not thinking anything of it. Like, oh, I don't have that. And, and I said, but where can I get one? <laughs> and he looked at me like, are you for real? And I went, I thought like you could go like, like you could go to the bodega and get a calling card or a token, whatever. I was just like, where can I get one? I'll go get one now. And maybe they can hold my place online. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and he's just like, you can't get in. And I was like, but I waited online. I've just been waiting for like an hour. And he goes, yeah, you and everybody else. So you can't get in. It's an EPI. I go, what's an EPI? He goes, equity principal interview. I was like, 
and then I think I said, well, how do you get an equity card? And he said, you have to get an equity job. And then I said, well, that's a catch 22, isn't it? He goes, yes, it is. Now, please get to me. Like, oh. well, I was so pissed <laughs> off, I guess, pissed off and a little humiliated that I went, I just was like, how do I get into this building? How do I get into this building? I went around the side of the building and I saw there's a fire escape. <laughs> and the windows were really wide, if I, if I recall correctly. And I jumped up until I pulled the ladder down. And I, and I knew the audition was on the sixth floor. <clears throat> Climbed the fire escape to the sixth floor. Knocked on the window at the sixth floor. And I think it was a law firm. And the woman at the desk looks out and she's like startled. And she's like, like this. And I go, can I come in? She opens the window. She goes, are you okay? Who are you? And I go, I'm just trying to get into this audition. I hear it's on this floor. And she goes, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I think I've seen some actors out there. And I go, can I come in? Can I get in? She lets me through. I go through the law. I get into the room. There's a bunch of act. And again, remember, I've never been, I don't know anything. I've never been to an audition. I've never acted. I've never opened my mouth yet. <laughs> Not even to say, except I can't twice. And there's a sign in sheet. So I go, okay, my name is Wendy Rosenberg. Right? I hadn't changed it yet. Wendy Rosenberg. And I see people have these scripts and they, they're calling them sides and people that look like me, that they might be reading for me, come in and out. I grab, when they leave, I grab their sides. And I go, oh, this, I think this would be good for me, this character, whoever her she is, Heidi or whoever she is. And I then wait for everybody to finish. And then the last person goes in, they call the last person on the sheet. Um, and th they go, wait, wait, um, who's Wendy Rosenberg? And I go, oh, that's me. And they go, I don't have you on this sheet, but I see you on this sheet. And I go, oh my gosh, I don't know why that would be. <laughs> and she goes, oh, I'm so sorry. She apologizes to me. <laughs> she goes, I'm so sorry. She goes into the room. She comes back out and she goes, I don't know where the mix up was, but we'll, of course we'll see you. We've been here a long time. And I went, <laughs> so she comes out. She goes, okay, you're next. I go in, I read, and I don't have an agent, right? So I put down my home phone number. Phone rings, uh, like that day. I think it was that night. And they go, we would like to offer you the part of the understudy. <laughs> and I was like, I, I was like, awesome. <laughs> I would love to see the guy outside. Did you ever see him again? <laughs> the guy outside. Oh, the guy outside. Yeah, no, I mean. I don't know the what happened. Assistant, <laughs> he wouldn't let you in the building. He turned into the pianist at the Sister Act audition later on. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I got the job. And then, of course, the next time I had a class with Peter Miner at the loft downtown on 18th Street, I walked in like an idiot and I went, hey, guys, <laughs> all these actors who've been trying to get jobs for you. I'm like, hey, guys, thank you so much. I got the job, and they go, "What job?" And I go, "The Broadway show." <laughs> you were the biggest hit of the class. <laughs> I all hated you, <laughs> of course. They're like, "What?" <laughs> so I just went in and I read. Thank you so much for the advice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking this class for four years, yeah. and you come in a week. <laughs> nobody does special programs like one-on-one -on -one next level it's where we really help actors shine i'm emilio i signed with my southeast agent right after the atlanta trip and now i'm auditioning several times every month and you know i almost didn't do the atlanta trip because i thought it was just another cash grab i can tell you from experience that it's not that's not how one-on-one -on -one next level rolls and here we are six months later and i already booked my first job with my atlanta agent I'm Rebecca, and the Bridge program demystified the industry for me. It gave me the platform to get off book in under 10 minutes. I met 60 new artists that are now all a part of my community, and I even signed with a manager. I have never walked away from a program so confident in my abilities. I'm so grateful for One on One Next Level. My name is Capenna, and I can finally call myself a working actor after participating in the LA Super Showcase. I had just moved to LA and I felt stuck. I came across the LA Super Showcase and let me tell you, it was a life-changing experience. I signed with an agent and since then, I've been auditioning for series regulars and booked my first TV job. I finally feel like I made it to the next level, thanks to one-on-one -on -one Next Level. 
In the next 12 months, One-on-One -on -one Next Level will host 27 special programs bringing you unmatched, exclusive access to industry connections. Special programs aren't just a one-and-done class. Instead, they're designed to accomplish in a weekend what it takes most actors months, even years to do. So whether you want to get repped in a smaller market like Atlanta, bypass casting directors and connect directly with TV showrunners and decision makers, or spend a weekend meeting a bunch of musical theater industry professionals in New York City, you have to become a member to be eligible to sign up for our special program. To apply, go to www.1on1nextlevel.com. We can't wait to hear your success story. And here's the moral of the story. The moral of the story is, I, I didn't know what I didn't know. So I didn't know how hard it was, how unlikely it was, how, you know, unusual it was to just walk into a room like that, having no experience and get a job like that and get your equity card like that. And your Broadway right? debut. And then I continued working all the time, still with no agent, by the way. It was just word of mouth. I was like doing the Guthrie. I was at the the Pioneer Memorial Theater. I did Amadeus. I like just continued to work. Mm -hmm. And... Um, but so when I look back, when, when I try to go back to that space of just remember what it's like to not know, mm. um, it's easy for me to say that because I really didn't know when I got my first job. But I really do believe that beginner's luck, that, that you know, cliches are cliches because they, they're meaningful, right? They come out of something um, that's true. And I think beginner's luck is just you have very little to no resistance because you're just a beginner. It's like the tarot card, speaking of the tarot card. You know, the fool, the tarot card that has the fool and it's like this sort of, um, uh, yeah, the fool, like a court jester type on a, on a cliff top and just with his arms open going like this, about to fall off a cliff with a smile on his face. Mm -hmm. And I love that card because it, that's what beginners, it's sort of like, yeah, let's see what happens. I don't know that there's, I'm, I might crash on the rocks and break all my bones, right? I'm just going to give it a go. Yeah. The only part you're, you're leaving out, Wendy, is um, where there is a will, there is a way. And your will was huge. Yes, see, the will was part of it. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me that. Yes, yeah, so there was an action that needed to be taken. I needed to make something happen. Uh, but I wasn't at the time going, you know, I want to be an actor so badly. I'll do anything I can to get that, right? It was just- You're getting into that building. I'm getting into that building. And yes. you know what I think it was? Elizabeth Gilbert has a wonderful um, uh, talk that she did with it on Oprah for some Oprah event. And I just happened to listen to it again last night, interestingly. Um, and it's about following your curiosity. Forget about passion, right? Mm -hmm. Follow your curiosity. And I think that's what I was really doing was I didn't have a passion yet. I didn't know I wanted to be an actor. I still didn't know after two years on the road if I wanted to be an actor. I was just like, this is cool. I'm making some money. This is cool. I've got some union card. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. So, but I made it happen by you made it happen. action along with the curiosity. The curiosity compelled me into action. And not only taking action, Wendy, but like getting those, uh, you know, the uh, singers and getting into that building. That's the strong will. That is you were resourceful, though. like you, you, like you, you didn't have those restrictions because maybe had you been in the industry a little bit longer in that acting oh class God. a little bit longer, you'd be like, I can't do that. You know, sure I, thing. They say that can't be done, and that right. happens. Do you know? I, I wanted to ask you what you thought of this. I, I'm supposed to be interviewed, but I'm going to interview you now. <laughs> I was watching. Um, I was watching some. I thought it was time that I listened to some casting people. Right. Um, I found all oh, they're on YouTube all the time and they're on backstage and all that stuff. And my actors are asking me questions sometimes that I can't answer because I'm an old folk. I'm, you know, I'm from the old days and mm -hmm. self taping and zoom. I can talk about it, mm -hmm. but audition class isn't the same now. Right. right. It's because everything is self taping. And I thought, well, it's time that I really, you know, did my students more of a service and figured out how can I serve them and take what I've learned and what we've talked about just here and somehow overlay it onto the self-taping thing. Like, mm -hmm. how can you do that with a self-tape mm -hmm. or a Zoom audition where you're in a waiting room? So I, I, I come upon on YouTube a guy, a casting person, who is deconstructing Dacre's self-tape and talking mm -hmm. about why it's so brilliant, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And in the process of talking about it, right, it, Dacre does, I think he has uh, three scenes that he does. And... 
It's brilliant. I mean, it's absolutely brilliant. And his active listening is off the charts. And he's gorgeous and he's beautiful and he's just like, and after he shows and after he shows it to the world and he breaks it down, he goes, now here's the interesting thing. Taker does is he does everything wrong. You're not supposed to have music. You're not supposed to ever take off your shirt. You're not supposed to do this and you're not supposed to do that. But he did it and he got the job. And I'm sitting there and I'm like this. Oh my gosh. If I'm a young actor or I'm watching this guy going, this is the best self tape ever, but he did everything you're not supposed to do. Now I'm really confused. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. you know yeah. what I mean? It's like, I did the best audition ever with Sister Act, apparently. It was written up in the New York Times, by the way, that audition, like a week <laughs> later. But, but nobody would ever sit there and go, here's what you should do. You mm -hmm. should bring in three backup singers or you should do something <laughs> crazy, right? Do something crazy every time. Because how many casting people say all the time, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. Make sure it's framed like this and framed like that. Make sure this, and, and understood, right? You got to have guidelines. Yeah. Otherwise it's going to be, you know, yeah. it's crazy, right? You're going to get these self tapes that are all over the place. So mm -hmm. you do have to have guidelines. But what's so confusing now, and my actors say this all the time, they go, well, I'm supposed to do something that catches everybody's eye and do something incredibly different or bold. Um, show my heart within the first 10 seconds. Um, and and do this and do that, but but then again, I'm not supposed to. But I'm not supposed to do anything different or have any props. But this casting guy is going. The reason this kid got it is because he did all these things differently, caught everybody's eye. Mm -hmm. But nobody's talking about the disconnect. Nobody's going. Yeah. You know, so basically, the rule is this: if you're going to do something different, it better be freaking amazing. Mm -hmm. Right. And authentic right. to like, to, to you, like, and not authentic you doing you. it because you saw, you heard on a podcast right. that Wendy brought in backup singers. So you didn't <laughs> do the exactly. same thing. Don't do it for the shock value. Is what, yeah. Right? You know, this reminds me of, um, you know, uh, you know, when, before, before the pandemic, uh, when I was running our, you know, in-person classes in LA, you know, in LA, everyone does TV and film scenes. Nobody brings in anything from a play. And there was a class of 22 actors for a big, big TV casting director. Because like mm -hmm. we don't, you know, in LA, all of our casting director classes are TV and film only. And this guy, he has, you know, numerous Emmy, Emmy awards for television, not even film, just television. Mm -hmm. And one actor in the class just goes, um, would you like be offended if I brought in a scene from a play? Um, and the guy was like, well, I only cast TV, but like if you wanted to, like, I guess you could bring in a scene from a play, like, you know, sure. And the following week, all 22 actors in the class brought in scenes from plays, which has never happened. It never happens in our LA studio. Nobody ever does scenes from plays. And I think that's an example of, you know, like you want to be, you, you want to stand out, but it has to be authentic. And sometimes people are searching for that. It's not like they want to be copycats, but it's like, oh, it worked for her. So I mean, it must have worked that. really well for everybody. Yeah. I mean, to come in yeah. and do that, right? Yeah. It must have worked really well. Yeah. It's the, yeah. Herd mentality, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is one of those things. I, I think actors just are so confused with good reason. I think, mm -hmm. um, because you can't on one hand go, here's the rule. It's hard and fast, right? Mm -hmm. Don't break mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. It's nice to just search for that. Here's the ones that we like the most, the ones that broke the rules. And if you're so worried about the rules, Wendy, face it, you, you, you play it safe and then you never get anything. Yeah, yeah. that's right. That's and right. There's no I mean, like let's, one let's solution. Say, that's Say that again. Ron. There's no one solution, like the 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 the, the one no, key no. that unlocks the treasure chest. Oh, that's right. And that and and there's no one way to play a scene. I mean, that's the the beauty of watching twenty different people play the same scene. And even if they even if they made the exact same choices, whatever that means, right, in the scene, it's going to be different because they're different. Their energy is different. Their personalities are different. It's just going to be different by virtue of the fact that they're different. But um, I, you know, one of the things I would love to talk about that, that, that has come up a lot is branding. When I 
started teaching, um, I was shocked after a bunch of years, I was shocked at how many students were saying, can we brand? Can we, can you, can we do branding at the end of the class? And I, Mark, I was like, what, what, what's that? <laughs> what, what? No, don't you not, you don't want to brand. You don't want to be branded, do you? Cause you want to stay open and fluid. And they're like, oh no, no, no. Oh no. We, that's the whole thing. And I was like, okay, teach me, <laughs> teach me what this is. And they taught me, they said, okay, so we're going to sit here and we're going to get up each one of us. And we're all going to say, you know, oh, that's a, you know, that's a young Nicole Kidman, or, you know, that's so-and-so sister, or you would be great in this part or that. And I finally said to them, why would you want this? <laughs> um, and they said, because nobody knows, you know, so that we can tell the industry what to do with us, basically. And I was like, okay, all right. But do, do you want to get pigeonholed? And they went, well, everyone wants to know. So when I, the, one of my students said, when I go out for interviews, right, my agents or managers are like, who do you think you would play? Or who do you want to play? Who do your friends see you as? And I go, wow, I don't remember that when I was, quote unquote, coming up, although it came up in such a zigzag way. But I don't remember that. But all I know is that for me, being branded was like the worst thing that, you know, People tried to, they were like, we don't know who you are. You're so different from role to role, right? It was actually a bit of a problem because people go, no, you didn't play that. No, you weren't in that. I saw that. Right? And you're standing here in front of me and that wasn't you. And like, <laughs> yes, it was. And I would be proud of it. And I would see behind their eyes going, this does not compute. So for some people, it was like, okay, this is too weird. I don't know what to do with her. And for other people, it would light up the fire in their eyes about you know how to represent me this is really cool she can do anything kind of thing but it was either or right so we finally um when branding started sort of becoming a thing um my agent said to me or my i think it was my manager said let's change agents but i want wendy i well, i'm gonna have to brand you and i was like no and i said and he goes i don't know how to do it and i said well why don't you just brand me as unbrandable because this long pause he goes the unbrandable actress. I like it. The unbrandable. <laughs> Wendy, the unbrandable. I love it. We went with it. So he was calling agents. He goes, they go, so what do we do with Wendy? Like, who is she now? She's older and is she playing moms? Is she playing grandma? You know, and my agent goes, she's unbrandable. She's the unbrandable <laughs> brand. If you're going to go to that extent, Wendy, why don't you get like a little logo and have like a horse thing and it, it says unbrandable. Like it's, it's like, Seared, you know, seared into the thing. Yeah, so that they don't forget. I'm brandable. So much, Mark. And, but it's it's what everybody seems to be obsessed with. I don't know if you've noticed that. It, uh, it, 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 not just acting, with everything. Is it really? Yeah. yeah. I think it was like a... I think it was like a really big, big thing. Like, I mean, it was like, it was like the new thing 10 years ago. It was like the new phrase, like branding. And Is it you still know. like as... I, yeah, I, I think so. Like, but I think now there's more people kind of being like, you know what, like, 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 what is that? Like, like whatever. You know. what is that? Because but Brian, can you elaborate? Cause like, don't you hear Brian? Like a lot of people, uh, you know, your age will say like, you know, what's your brand? Right. Right. There's, there's that. And there's, you know, all the, all the articles and, you know, all the places. And I, I think like really like five, 10 years ago, that was like the thing. And everyone had to like, you know, nail, nail it down. And you know how there's always like a, like a counter reaction that happens. With oh, like I hope so. Uh, and always the pendulum does swing always too far the other way. And right. when does it ever rest? But, but I want, I, branding is so limited. It's so limiting. But yeah. so then I had to sort of go, okay, I have to go with the flow. That's what's happening out there in the world. And like everything else, I started watching more YouTube videos. And like, I got to catch up, right? And then I thought, okay, so what, is, what could be good about it? And then I realized what's great about it is that um, if you have to be branded, right? And if everybody's just going to see you one way, if at least that gets you in the door and that gets you job for the first, jobs for the first, so be it. Get the jobs and then say, hey, everybody, now that I've made a name for myself, now that, um, you know, I'm worth something maybe to you guys and making you guys money. I really don't want to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. I want to do this. So maybe you just have to, that's the route you have to take in order to get, you know, yeah. you know get work first and then expand. I've heard that. And then you can expand. Of, you know, right. So I kind of leaned into it. I'm like, okay, 
Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't done it yet, grab the backstage pass. You've got to get the backstage pass. There's behind the scenes footage. We've taken the biggest takeaways from the episode and written them down for you. There's also tools and resources to help move your career forward. It's the easiest way to turn this podcast into a tool for your career, as opposed to something you just listen to as you're doing the dishes. Thank you.